This week's episode of This Is Only A Test is made possible by you, our fabulous listeners. Thank you for listening every week to the podcast, for sending your notes, and watching our videos. And if you want to see more tested content, things that we have not yet posted to the YouTube channel, you can always get an early access look at our website by joining the Tested Premium community and getting this year's special poster gift from Adam. Go find out more at tested.com slash membership. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, April 4th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. It's coming. Dot. I just remembered I have a new song. Come. How long can he hold his breath? Wow, that's different. Change is scary. Somebody just super scary. Somebody sent it. Oh my goodness! Is yeah, this that's this courtesy I, of Darren Holbrook? Thank you, Darren. Thanks for sending that, that was awesome cool. piece of music. It's not anything I could ever imagine playing on a piano, but it was I if like, Depeche Mode did uh, yeah. did our intro. Song. Did you hear the voice? Yes, it's subtle. Whose voice is that? I don't know. Well, maybe it's Darren's voice. Welcome to the podcast this week, and it feels like it's been a long time because it has been since we've all been in this room together. We have my two co-hosts, the purveyor of pinball, Jeremy Williams. Hi, Norm. Welcome to Kishore. And and the surveyor of science, Kishore Hari. Hello. Back back. back from uh, a week off. We had Will in last week. Was that just last week that we talked about all the Apple news? Oh, my God. Yeah. Been a long week. I'm back from Florida. Do you like my tan? Everyone <laughs> looks good. <laughs> looks really good. Sure. <laughs> well done. Uh, so we have a lot to go over this week, but I do want to hear about your travels because I hear you went to both Walt Disney World and Universal Studios. Yes, I went to six parks in six days. Amazing. Uh, in Florida, and I I survived. I and they literally had shirts that said. I survived like Disneyland or, and they had one shirt for kids that said, I won't remember anything that happened this week. You know, when I was uh, 12 years old, uh, I'm sorry to, to interject in your story, but the th- I went to Universal Studios Hollywood for the very first time. And the only thing I wanted, I only wanted one piece of memorabilia was an I survived Jurassic Park, the ride t-shirt. And I got that. That was the only thing my parents bought me when I was there. I rode, rode the ride, waited four hours in line with my cousins, and I wore that shirt out from age 12 to 14. Good story. We got to bring that back, bring that shirt back. I, I want to find it. Uh, we spent the the first couple days at Universal Orlando, and there's, um, there's three parks total there. We went to two of them that had the Harry Potter stuff. And uh, the Harry Potter stuff is just... It's mind blowing in set design. Well, you had just gone to the Harry Potter in, in LA. LA. Yeah, and this is so much bigger. And there's this part where you're walking down what appears to be a London street, and you turn into essentially like a an alleyway, like a little passage in a brick wall, and all of a sudden you're in Diagon Alley. And it's just a massive transformation of set design and aesthetics. It's just so beautifully done. I, I I thought there that uh, transition mm-hmm. from real world Mugg- to Muggle Harry, space, Muggle to to Wizarding World is done so well. Like you you get on the Hogwarts Hogwarts Express, but you go in through King's Cross Station. Yes, it is a fake representation of the train station, mm-hmm. and like you said, it's a brick wall that you walk through because they have a series they have a of illusion. mirrors, that, so it looks mm-hmm. like someone just walked the person in front of you walked through the wall wow. into the other world. You've been there. I've been there. I didn't realize I've been that. to both. So Universal Studios, the way it's set up in Florida, this is where Nickelodeon was shot uh, back in the day, where all those great kids TV shows were shot. Now it's like the Blue Man Group Arena Stadium, whatever. But it's two theme parks there, just like in uh, Disneyland land in California, there's Disneyland and California Adventure. Over in Florida, you have Universal Studios and then also Islands of Adventure, two separate parks. But they are connected by train. They're connected by the Hogwarts Express now, which is actually, even though it's just a train for taking you from point A to point B, they have videos up uh, so you see the characters and there's a little mini story that happens along your ride. Uh, I, I went during spring break, so the 
enormous amount of crowds. But mm. even then, it's still deeply enjoyable. I have to say the best thing, because I think the set design is so good, uh, the projection mapping they do at night on the side of Hogwarts Castle is just impeccable. It is it's very much like a straight copy of what Disney does at Magic Kingdom, but who cares? It's still beautiful. Yeah. And just like they celebrate all of the houses. Uh, I thought it was spectacular. Um, In the uh, the rides itself aren't like that great. There's one really good ride. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, well, in the theme park world, it's called theming, how much like set yeah. design they do. And they really, Universal spent all that money. There's a great uh, deep dive story about why Universal has the rights to Harry Potter and Disney doesn't. And it was one of the best investments Universal ever made, has kind of paid back in full, even just in the butterbeer money they've made back. But two rides. So each Universal Studios and uh, Islands of Adventure each have a flagship Harry Potter ride of which one of them is in la i believe the one yeah. you did in la jeremy was that the um forbidden uh, journey is the one okay. that uh is in la and in orlando where well, you're in the robot and that, arm and the, yeah and that one like the arm articulates and moves you and you see video screens and it's that sort of standard you if you remember the old back to the future ride it's that model of like a screen and you feel like you're falling at points but the arm itself moves along the track so you're going from physical space to physical space and you and, see you know, animatronics and yes. there's there's a storyline to follow wonderful that's wow. a really good ride it's it's really spectacular and it's essentially the same in both places and then there's one called escape from gringotts where you supposedly yes. you get into like sort of one of the carts in wait, the wait, bottom wait. of the bank gringotts is the bank yeah it's a goblin bank you got to go through the bank first you have to you go through the, the bank. tellers they're, they're all animatronic and the have... animatronics are are pretty good they're not as good as what i saw at disney mm. even though these are newer ones and we even went to gringotts money exchange where there's a goblin that interacts with you there's i think a person on a mic that's literally will oh. respond to your questions uh he was quite rude to my wife what? i have to say <sighs> he's a goblin when she asked how much money he had he goblin. was not happy about that question um but anyway, so I thought the animatronics were good but they're not great because they're not full body they're just sort of like torso up they look good, but I think their movements aren't as quite a, you know, like, uh, precise as mm -hmm. they could be. Anyways, you go down through the bank. You get into essentially what is supposedly like a mining cart, yep. just like in the movie. And you proceed, but it's one of those 3D ones. And um, I felt like the storyline falls apart in the 3D as you're going through. It has a little of the 4D nature where like stuff comes at you a little bit. And there's, this is a little bit of my take on Universal 3D rides because there's so many of them. There's Spider-Man. There's Fast and the Spider-Man was one of the first that they yeah. that, that ride. They all are still doing the, look out, here comes a thing in your face, yeah. like where they're just doing the same old like 3D um, Did you do techniques. King Kong? Yes, I did oh, King Kong. Come on. King Kong's one of the best. King Kong was, was really um, uh, quite di – that was the first ride we did at that park that day. And I found actually like the waiting line more terrifying because the they have itself. the giant bugs. Yeah, and... they have like big spiders, and they have like a like a gypsy priestess kind of woman, like uh, animatronic, and um, uh, it was it was quite scary. Uh, it, they use this kind of bus model, which Fast and the Furious use. Fast and Furious is ridiculously. I didn't. Do You're that. in a party bus, and the like. You like the whole goal is to work with. Hobbs and Shaw and whatever the Vin Diesel guy is to get to a party. Wait, did that replace the Transformers ride? No, Transformers is still there. Okay. But it's funny. You're in a party bus and then you end up at a ride and you're watching 3D representations of people just like dancing and yeah. like shimmying. It's pretty funny. So uh, I will say the one thing, uh, Universal Studios has tons of rides. Uh, the one thing that Disney does a lot better, just not just the difference between the rides itself, is the presentation of where the rides are. Universal Studios really leans into the design aspect of it being like a Hollywood back lot. And so you have sound stages that are the house of rides. So it's basically here's a giant warehouse building with a hue that goes all the way around it. Um, and you go in, whereas Disney tries to hide the rides. You're a lot. more immersed yeah. in a land. Yeah. And yeah. Well, Universal Studios in LA is actually also a studio is the one that you went to as well do they mm -hmm. actually they shoot films there uh they still have a lot there that they shoot i think they shoot mostly tv, TV. shows uh but anyway, i have to say the food at universal is better than at disney to a certain extent at least like uh, some of the meals at the um, at the hotel but i had a grand old time at, at like harry potter was worth it 
uh, enough. And I'm a big Potterhead, casting the spells, doing all of that, interacting. I had an interaction with um, with a cast member that l- looked at my mo- wand and like looked at the core of it and see if and see if like it matched my character. The RFID chip is still present. You didn't yes. have a bootleg wand. <laughs> Uh, so there's all I, I, I loved it. Uh, Disney World. We went to four parks. We went to the four main parks. We went to Magic Kingdom. We went to Epcot. We went to Animal Kingdom and we went to uh, the Hollywood Studios. Yep. Um, and we did basically every major ride at those parks with the exception wow. of the Avatar ride. Oh, because it was like a almost a four hour wait. To get you had done ride. your your research. You you had a schedule touringplans.com that would they're the best put most people's dads to shame that was impressive it was how i managed my anxiety i planned the trip down to a minute uh we also big shout out to um to ken a, a tested listener that um uh that kind of hooked us up and and helped us with our planning uh but yeah we went on all the major rides it was weird going on some of the old school rides like Small World and Peter Pan's Flight. Why was um, that weird? It's just it, like it brings back the nostalgia. But you can see like these tiny updates like Pirates yeah. of the Caribbean. They took out the wench. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Auction. But you all and they added in um, what's his face? The Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp. Jack, Jack Sparrow yeah. stuff, which is kind of a downer. Um, but um, is that identical to the one in Anaheim? Except it does not recede down. The one at Anaheim is under, so the, it yeah. starts off with like a small drop. Mm-hmm. This one doesn't have the small drop. We did do um, an Animal Kingdom, the Navi River Journey, which is uh, just an Avatar boat ride. Okay, there's an animatronic in there that is so good. Uh, it's of the you know the whatever one of the what priestess. Name? Yeah, the priestess, and she's singing, and it's just it's spectacular. It's in black light. Mm. It's just spectacular how that animatronic looks. And it just gives you a peek at uh, the transition. What I also noticed, we we did the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train at Magic oh, Kingdom, which yes. is a new yes. uh, roller coaster, which is perfect for my, my kid. Um, Why Seven Dwarfs? I would think that that would be, there's no current Snow White movie. Why is that a thing? I don't know. Classically hmm. legacy story, right? It's that's neat. But the dwarves are the new animatronic styles are backlit faces. Yes, yeah, so their projection faces mapped. are projection mapped. Yeah. And so the the bodies are all animatronic, but that projection mapping is so good. Yeah. And I mean you can tell when you're really looking at it, but as you're just passing through in a ride, you don't notice it. So it ends up being really seamless and allows them to do a lot more expression of the characters. Is it like Buzz Lightyear and Toy Story Midway exactly. Mania? Exactly. And that's yeah. where they kind of experimented with that. Same with the cars ride. And now they got the faces, but those were not hmm. human faces. And yeah. these are, yes, cartoons. I think it's why it works well. They had to get um, the projection throw to work on a space that size and also the silicone skinning. Are they internally projected? They're internally like projected. Rear projected. Rear oh. projected in the faces. And uh, did you do the Frozen ride at Epcot? Uh, I didn't. So that one has really amazing silicone um, uh, animatronics as well. So I hadn't been to Epcot since 93. And so there's only a few things that are left over besides like each of the lands. One of the, um, or I haven't been to Disney World since 93. And one of the things I remember doing was Star Tours. And I went on Star Tours again. It totally holds up. It's like, well, they've revamped it, right? They yeah, it's the like prequels. You have like the, the branching storylines. You get like a mix of the, th- the three acts. I was, mix, uh, I was mix surprised. And match. Uh, so you'll appreciate this. So, first thing we did when we got to Hollywood Studios is I signed up my kid for Jedi training. Yes. And uh, while we're in line, we're in this like long line to sign up. I start telling Wendy, who doesn't listen to this show, my wife, about uh, Gary. And what he said about Jedi training. And you know what's a mistake? Is having your son overhear a story about how Darth Vader is going to kick the shit out of a bunch of people that are uh, coming up for Jedi training. So he freaks out and doesn't want to do Jedi training. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, that's my goof. It's funny that you had to sign up because I haven't – I guess I've been to Disneyland since they started that. But they used to just pick people out of the audience. Everyone used to come dressed up, and they'd hold up signs saying, pick me, pick me. There's too many people at Disney parks now to do that anymore. Too much Every, disappointment because yeah. they can't pick everybody. Yeah, so now it's like stand in a line, sign up for your time slot. Sign your liability waiver. Yeah, they they have robes for all the kids yeah. and stuff. Um, and still, Darth Vader doesn't kick the crap out of any kids. It's disappointing. Yeah. Um, I did uh, kind of peek over the fence at Galaxy's Edge and see it from the backside. <sighs> It looks good. 
Um, good. good. Like you okay. see rocks. You heard stuff. it here first, folks. I think it. I think it might be good. <laughs> Should have I have a drone to say, there, deployed it. I have to say, it's not very big. Like the the physical square footage is not very big. If you've been to Toy Story Land, it seems similar, oh. which is pretty small. You know, I might be wrong and told, but that's just my impression of like looking over, looking at the fence. And they in my mind, it's Cars Land. Like they, Cars Land's right. real big. But they do an excellent force perspective with the cliffs in the they background. They do, yeah. So yeah, it's going to yeah. feel big. Right. Yeah, so they're doing the same thing here, and you could see the the cliffs from the backside and, and stuff. Um, I have to say my favorite thing is in Epcot, um, they had the flower and garden show. And one of the things they had as a special for that is they had a Coco live performance. And so they had a mariachi band come out and sing songs from the movie. Oh, and great. then they had a puppeteer come out as Miguel uh, to sing a song. It's just, it was just beautiful to hear. Like, that's the thing I feel like is the only thing that's missing a little bit from Disney is just more of the live music from some of the songs. Like you the get enjoyment that of the park without having to go to a ride you can yeah. still have a lot of little fun delightful moments we did a couple of small things we did this like card game called sorcerers the magic kingdom that's like hidden key boxes oh I just, like around the park yeah oh wow my daughter would love that it's so it's so good there's people that collect the cards um but last thing i'll say is just the projection mapping on the magic kingdom itself is so spectacular it makes it unrecognizable at points during the show mm. and the technology they deploy to just essentially show like a mini movie on the side of the castle is just incredible see i saw the halloween projection mapping at disneyland and it was a it was like a temporary you know one week event and i wasn't impressed by what they projected like that it was accurate it was on the correct parts of the building but what they chose to project was movie scenes they weren't custom made for the shape of the thing they were projecting on oh no this was totally different so okay. like the the castle would transform into like a French building, and then there would be like That's the awesome. Iago like ringing the bells. Or is that the name of that hunchback Iago? No. What's the uh, yeah? What's his name? The hunchback from Notre Dame. Yes. Yeah, yeah that'll do. <laughs> I don't know what his name is. <laughs> Whatever. But like you know, but so it was obviously custom, and there were characters in there doing stuff. But it wasn't just like they were randomly there. They that, were part of a scene. That's what you hope for. That's mm -hmm. cool. Uh, did you? Stay at Epcot to the very end with the fireworks, and did you do drinking around the world? That's something to do. <laughs> I, tr I, there's so many worlds you can't drink. Like it, you will be fall down drunk if you try to drink around. They the serve world. alcohol at every. They land? serve alcohol. I think just at Epcot. I want to say right. no, all no, the, all it's the, everywhere. It's oh, that's everywhere. right. It's different from Disney World, Walt Disney World, and Disneyland. But so yeah, like, okay. I had to say, like, it, there is an aspect of Disney World right now that feels like family Vegas. Because there's drinking everywhere. I went to Disney Springs, which is their mall, like high end mall as well. Did you and there's the, like the live boardwalk? bands everywhere. Yeah, I love the. the I mean, it it's, boardwalk area. I, I don't mean it as like a dispersion, but there is like kind of a party vibe to Ve uh, to Disney World that's a little Vegas like, you know, mm -hmm. a little more controlled and stuff. Um, but yeah, the we we did a little drinking around the world, but. They also had the Flower and Garden Show and seeing like the topiaries they created was was pretty cool. There's just so much to do. Did you have the RFID band? Yeah. How did that affect your stay? Uh, just made everything easier. Yeah, but uh, what does it do? Uh, so you use it for payment. You use it for getting into parks. You use it for your fast pass to get on rides oh. quicker. You use it for everything. You don't get hard copy fast passes anymore? You can as a backup. Um, but huh. people staying at the hotels on, on property get these magic bands. Which huh. one did you stay in? Uh, we stayed at Art of Animation, which is oh, it's yeah. Little Mermaid, Lion King, and Cars themed, mm. and it has all of these like sketches from the movies um, on display in the lobby. They have like drawing um, uh, classes during the day, and it was sort of is kind of perfect um, for real lovers of the art. And then they have these giant sculptures of of uh, the characters from the movie. You've, you've not lived until you've been in the Little Mermaid section and seen a seven-foot fork. <laughs> <laughs> did you do uh, Spaceship Earth, the uh, the inside the, the dome? Did Spaceship Earth? Like, in Dame Judy Dench is now like helping narrate a little part of it, and nice. it's sort of updated. Uh, I love Spaceship Earth. It's just the nostalgic quality of it. Uh, I hear that ride is, uh, is going to get a refresh soon, maybe. Oh. Fantastic. Um, and then uh, we did Mission Space, oh, which is the yes. one where you spin around. It's not Gary Sinise, though. It's Gina Torres from Firefly. Interesting. You, um, uh, it's still kind of an intense ride, but I love it because it was 
sort of realistic. You know, you know, Wendy was making fun of a lot of the rides at Universal because they have the same kind of trajectory. They're like, we're going on an adventure. Oh, no, something went wrong. Um, and so uh, even Mission Space had uh, had that a little bit. But it was good. It, I thought Disney did a better job of not telling that same old trope through all the rides. Uh, it was pretty remarkable. There's so many people at Disney now. It's insane. And there's no down season. So it's yeah. sort of like... I I'm kind of, I'm glad I did it. I can't see myself being there every year just because of how <laughs> intense it is. It's like totally intense. <laughs> you know what's going to be pretty expensive too. Or, or just like, you know, it's one of those things where I, I felt like I did it. Very good. Uh, that's awesome. We love hearing about trips to theme parks. Yeah, And you know what? We should probably go to other theme parks too. I, I haven't been to Legoland in the longest time. You I know, wonder what that's like. Legoland's good for a certain age. It's not good for really? anyone over the age of like... I'm not talking about Knott's Berry Farm here. I'm talking 10. about Legoland. I'm with you. Oh, man. Oh, well, maybe Disney Around the World then is our next stop. Because now we've all talked about being at Disneyland here, Walt Disney World in Florida. And uh, obviously, they opened like Disney Shanghai, but we know there are a lot of listeners out there who like Disney, or, or some of you work at Disney, uh, and feel free to, to reach out and share your stories. Yeah. What's the best non-American Disney park? That's what I want to know. Paris Disney? Is I've it? been to Japan Disney. I think Hong it's got to be Shanghai, right? They but have the Tron um, roller coaster. Yeah, that's yeah. the new one. That yeah. would be interesting. What about Tokyo? I've been to Tokyo Disney. It's good. It's good. There's they, a 20,000 parks as well. Sea. Is there? Yeah, they have uh, a whole water side. The volcano ride. Uh, it's been a long time, though. Uh, anyway, uh, there goes our long recap. But now let's get to some news. In fact, let's get to our... Top story this week. All right. So we're going to skip to a bunch of VR news, at least a big bit of, I don't know if we can count, yeah, it is news, because it, it was something that was officially put out there, but surprise announcement, teaser, I don't know what you want to call it, but Valve Software, who we know have been working, uh, not only did they develop the Steam VR tracking system and work with HTC to put the Vive, but also had been working on new uh, prototype controllers in the Knuckles controllers. We got to use one of those dev units a while back. How long ago was that? That was like a year and a half ago. So So they've been working on this for a bit. Yeah, and then there's a new Knuckles revision, and of course at GDC, there was the new Moondust 3.0 demo. Knuckles is, of course, their track control allows finger tracking, finger presence as well. It also also allows you to let go entirely. Exactly. Because it grips onto the center of your hand. So you can uh, throw a football. Or you can grip things and not grip things. And never throw your controller. And not throw exactly. Uh, we didn't know whether that was going to be released with the headset or not, or whether this was just a prototype. Well, this isn't exactly Knuckles-related news, but it is a headset, presumably. Uh, Valve has a landing page, which they show an image, and they say, what, information coming in May, and, or, uh, and uh, it is a picture of a headset. The bottom of a headset. With <laughs> well, the angle toward the bottom, yep. mm-hmm. in which you very clearly see uh, two cameras. Two front-facing cameras. Two front-facing, uh, fr- world-facing cameras, and and then also uh, a physical IPD adjustment. Well, presumably, presumably that is an IPD adjustment, yes. A button underneath I think that's that. reasonable to expect yes. that that's an IPD and adjustment. Then I think it's no small coincidence that this is the photo they picked a week or so after Oculus Shots fired. releases the... Uh, New or announces the Rift S with no physical IPD adjustment. Yeah, and uh, and then the words Valve Index on it. Now, you left off the attached headphones too. Oh yes, yes, that's right, and and also built-in headphones. It looks like now in the week since maybe like the six days since this this page yeah. has gone online, there's been so much leaked information about this well, that it's kind of staggering. Well, and deduced information from the image I- immediately after it was discovered. I don't even know how this website got, went live. Did Valve ever officially link this from somewhere or was it discovered? It was I, I think it was it was discovered, it was it was put out there. It was put out there. It was there. put out there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, people immediately took the image into Photoshop and increased the contrast 
and saw what appears to be divots or some sort of different uh, contrasty areas throughout the headset. So they reduced the contrast so that things would show up. Yeah, Yeah, so they brightened everything. Yes. And so it looks like this will be a lighthouse headset, just like the previous five. Right, because the speculation was, uh, the question was whether this would be, what kind of tracking system would it use? Is it inside out, presumably with those two cameras? Because we see two cameras, yeah. Right, or those two cameras, presumably for something else, like a pass-through video system. Um, But the contrast image shows, the low contrast image shows lighthouse sensors. Yeah. And so presumably they it will use uh, the lighthouse 2.0 beacons because mm-hmm. they've been working on that, if not something newer, who knows. Um, but it seems like a culmination of, of all these experimental technologies that they've been teasing and, and iterating on since the original Vive release. Well, this now, and that's the other thing. It's not Vive branded. That's it. Yeah, it's, it's Valve. Well, we don't know what the product is yet, right? We'll find out very soon. But it looks like it might be first party branded. Yes. So who knows whether Valve has been working with their own manufacturing partners to put this out or whether there's a manufacturing partner that's just not putting their brand on it. Um, we don't know what that means about the relationship with HTC. Yeah. The idea was that they had launched with HTC as a launch partner, but HTC Vive and SteamVR are kind of separate things. Anyone can build out their own Steam VR headset. And there mm-hmm. have been other Steam VR headsets. The Pimax uses Steam VR. You know, LG had put out that prototype. And it just sounds like this could be uh, I don't know if, I don't know what Valve's intent is. Like do they want to control the hardware? Th- that's not like their MO. they it's like they've previously just wanted to put a technology out there, but it hasn't really adopted in the same way. Um, in, in a way that I think they, they would have liked. I don't know. That's a good question. I, I wonder if HTC hasn't followed through with what they want for VR, and uh, now Valve has taken it into their own hands. I think it's just exciting that we're that they're finally doing this, whether or not it's through H- HTC, that we're seeing a follow-up to the Vive. So a lot of questions about this headset, and some of those questions, at least we, I don't know if we have definitive answers, but we have a lot of speculation based on those. Like, obviously, we don't see the inside of the headset. We don't know what the resolution is, the field of view, or the lensing system, but we can speculate because there was a developer video that got put out this past week that's since been edited that looked like it had some technical specifications on a Steam VR menu page. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't even see that. Yeah, and it was already deleted. So you know how you can adjust your uh, graphic sliding, uh, graphic slider options? Um, you can adjust it based on whether you want to render at 100% or you can yeah. oversample or uh-huh. uh, upscale. Depending on how powerful your PC is. Exactly. That menu popped up in a video from a developer. Okay. And it showed in the bottom, the, you know the Steam VR menu? It yeah. showed the icons for this headset and the Knuckles controllers which is what makes people assume this will be bundled or uh, work with, with the knuckles yeah. controllers. But in the, this low-res crop of a menu where it shows their scaling, people have identified that this is basically either that this works at natively uh, super sample, so it would be the Vive Pro resolution, or it's a much higher resolution headset in line with this prototype LCD display uh, that was shown a year and a half ago, or a year ago, at Display World. Um, so, again, we don't know. Uh, the name Index? Yeah, what do you think of that? Well, <laughs> on its face, it's not a great name. It's a weird name. Right, but then the speculation now is that it talks. it's referencing Index of Refraction, and going back to leaks that people had surfaced in- from... Index of Refraction. Lensing. Right. Okay. And the leaks that people have pulled up from, you know, whatever images they've they found the corner of blog posts. Yeah. And things like that. Uh, they think that it's a stack Fresnel system, and this is supposed to be some way of giving an ultra wide okay. view and okay. getting rid of things like, uh, like uh, God rays. Yeah. Um, okay. And so again. Yeah. And, and the logo too, right? The internet's been very busy. The internet's been super busy. <laughs> well, and then on the Steam, uh, the Steam app or the Steam website, there was a temporary like page that popped up. It's not up anymore. No, no, they this, took it down. This so, pre-order so page. We saw this, the front of the headset, and it showed the front of the headset. Yeah. And it, now, uh, Road to VR um, reached out to Valve, and Valve confirmed that the company is targeting May first for a reveal, which will include pre-orders. And um, and that the page is incomplete, but that the specs are accurate. The specs are basically, yes, while not comprehensive, is accurate. Yeah. So June fifteenth ship date then, uh, because that's what the page said. No, they haven't. Well, 
I, I mean the tech specs for the for the PC. So what do you think about it? Because um, I've heard two different numbers that it's really a 1070 is going to be recommended now for what it uses. Isn't that what Oculus recommends now? Or are they still 970? No, 970. Hmm. Yeah, because they're, they're age of hertz. Yeah, I mean, fine. Raise it up. Raise the bar. I, th- I think it's fair. We've had VR for three years now. You know, and 1070 really is the equivalent of just a 980. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So just slightly in, in, uh, bumped up. And you know Valve and CVR had that, like their version of the, the time warp system that they released uh, a yeah. couple months ago to, to improve frame rates. I'm sure that was also leading up to this. So there was also leaked photos months ago, you know, where we saw in development That's what I'm talking about. where yeah, the yeah. front case off of the headset. It's right. very much this headset, the same form factor. The cameras are in the same place. And we can see from that headset that there are no other cameras that we can see. There's only those two on the front, which leads mm. me to think that initially when I saw that the first image, I was like, oh, maybe it's inside out. Maybe it has the option of inside out, even if there is lighthouse support. But it doesn't, I don't imagine that's the case. I think it's more like a Vive Pro solution where there's stereo cameras and they'll put those to use in some interesting way. Some path, pass through. Yeah. Don't call it AR, call it pass through, some mixed sure. reality solution. Uh, also, in those photos, there was a cavity. In the front of the headset. Right. And it looks like with the ultra contrast version of what we saw in the official photo. that, that Unofficial, the leaked page photo. That that, st- that that area still exists. And it looks yeah. very much like it would fit like an off-the-shelf uh, leap motion. Mm. Right? Mm. So, I mean, that would be interesting for hand tracking. I mean, leap motion as a product is not that expensive. Why wouldn't they just build it in? Why yeah. would it be a module to swap in and out? I don't know. I, and maybe I'm completely wrong about that, but would be an inter- compelling way to add f- pretty inexpensive hand dragging. Right, or or let that be an upgradable solution later yeah. on as leap motion gets better, as those IR sensors um, get better. Pimax is doing that. They have a third-party leap motion you know, thing yeah, you can you add snap to it. In. But it's their, yeah. own, it's their special form factor. Right. Any guesses on price? I mean, this must fulfill... It, 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 so qu- a lot of questions about what the headset is, the, the display, mm-hmm. right? Right, and it... But it does sound like this is what people had wanted potentially out of a Rift S in it being catering to uh, the high end for people who mm-hmm. bought in Steam VR, bought games already, and want wider field of view, want higher resolution, want knuckles controllers. Maybe. I mean, will they cannibalize Vive Pro by going to that resolution? Or I don't something think they care in... about Vive Pro. Very mm-hmm. clearly, this is not an HTC headset. I don't know. It's the price is interesting because Oculus is clearly charging less than HTC ever has for the same amount of hardware, and I wonder if Valve feels like they're in Oculus's position where they can afford to sell these at cost and make it up on software sales later, or what? I don't know what what their MO is. I don't think their business model is to build a giant user base uh, to make money on those games later. Their MO is to not let Oculus. Control the destiny of VR. Facebook. Facebook control VR. Yeah. By giving an alternative for high end users, they know who, through all their you know Steam survey tracking, have there's a good subset of those users who have high end computers yeah. who want to spend the money, and Valve has a very important piece of gaming IP they could potentially attach to this, and that's oh. the other big speculation, right? Is what what if it's Half Life Three play? Ha- but Valve is staunchly anti exclusives. So they, they wouldn't require their headset to run Half-Life 3. They wouldn't do that. I don't imagine. What of the best experience? But they could make the best experience rely on the Knuckles controllers. Right. The best quality field of view, best experience potentially. Like, I, I think you're right. I don't think that if they were ever to put out a Half-Life 3, this is us, us thoroughly, like, throwing shitballs at the wall now. Uh, I don't think it would not work on a Vive or even an Oculus headset. Yeah. But I think that it would probably work best on, as, on as far as price goes, like, do you think they'll shoot for four hundred? I think it's gonna be eight hundred. Yeah, this okay. has got to be to the higher end. So, I mean, but then if the, if their mo is to compete with Oculus and not let Facebook own virtual reality, don't they have to come down in price? Because isn't that the determining factor no. for so many people? I don't know if I buy that because I do think there's like a small, and you you both have proved this out. There's a small loyal. Mm-hmm part of the base that it wants higher end VR yeah. and is willing to pay for it. Mm-hmm. So I could really see Valve trying to just own that that share of the market. And the big difference also with their uh, Steam VR with the the Lighthouse tracking system is that it works really well for 
location-based experiences. And a lot of uses for Vive have been, like you, like you tried out in the, uh, the Vertigo Games arcade system in, in kind of VR arcades, um, domestically and very popularly internationally. Yeah. So maybe this is a play for that. Get, get those businesses really using um, the index or you know, the Steam VR system. Mm, maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't. It, it it kind of fills that hole that we uh, we were hoping for this year for a high end VR headset. But we don't know yet. I, I know we don't know. We, that's uh, that's my guess. Yeah, and maybe my hope. If it, even like the thing that excites me the most, besides the knuckles controllers, because I do think interface is an under you know uh, Developed. Dis- discussed yeah. aspect of virtual reality. I think that could be huge if the if the knuckles controllers are much or more immersing. That could be big. Um. It's the field of view. Like, if, if it actually does go to 135, that's a substantial amount of more area that will fill your peripheral. And that 135 comes from back of the napkin math that Redditors have done on right. on leaked images. Which is always 100% accurate. I know. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Uh, gosh. I'm happy with something like the touch controllers. I'm more happy with the touch controllers than I have been with the first gen with the Vive controllers, the Vive. Yeah, the ones. The ones. Sure. Um, for uh, most games, you know, mm-hmm. games, even cross platform games, playing a game, playing Rec Room with, on, on Steam VR versus playing Rec Room with the Rift, I'm always going to choose the Rift, even if I have the Vive Pro, because I think the interaction model is better and more fun with those natural hand mm-hmm. controller gestures. Right. Knuckles could change that, uh, but there's got to be. Applications adding really take advantage of it. Adding the joystick to Knuckles, I think, was crucial for me because I love having that on touch. So yeah. now you've got both options on Knuckles. Yeah, and I, I'm curious whether they're going to push for room scale. When Vive came out and when CMVR first launched, all those games really, really were about room scale, and it kind of it allowed developers to to build out really large play spaces. Uh, but you could tell developers wanted to go bigger, and so they had to resort to other locomotion mechanics. And yep. I think a couple years in the VR now, we find ourselves, it's more convenient and honestly more comfortable to use things like a stick and use stick movement. Right. Rather, and and, and stick, even stick turning. But now both of the majors support room scale out of the box. Right, right. So Or will. And, and we've played games recently that could take advantage of room scale, but we've, like Space Junkies, but honestly, it's more fun standing and, and just and, and moving the sticks. Yeah, no, I played uh, um, Dead and Buried on the, on the Quest. It naturally supports room scale. You can walk as far as you want with the mm-hmm. Quest. Yeah. But I found myself planted in place. And, and so the question is, is that because your brain hasn't acclimated to the fact that you can walk around that no. much space? Or is it because... I think walking around serves itself really well to Job Simulator, where you're walking around a space and you can take your time and explore. It's puzzle games. great for an, for an escape room. Yeah, escape room puzzle. But for game. action games, I, I it's too fast. Yeah. I think it's too fast. But, of course, dodging, you want space like with Lone Echo and whatnot. You want to be able to move enough so that you can get out of the way. Super hot, that, that kind exactly, of thing. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But so, that, that's not room scale so much as a big space you can weave around in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And even when you're talking about a mechanic like uh, dodging bullets and super hot, that essentially becomes a puzzle game. Right. right, you're methodical. Yeah. When you talk about methodical movements, that's where the room scale really kicks in. It's going to be exciting, exciting springtime. It is. Folks. This is a huge year for VR, it turns out. Yeah, who would have thought it? 20, 2019. 2019. I just, I just want to say, you both have said that every year since I've been on this podcast, so... Yeah, well, this is... I mean, it's always been true, this but is a, it's, it's like... It's a hardware year. It's a hardware re- refresh year, and that's exciting. Hopes and dreams, fellas. All right, um, let's move on. Okay. Did you get your tickets yet? Did you get them? Did you get them? I got mine. Did you get them? I finally got mine. Uh, We're recording this on Wednesday, but uh, if... If you're listening on this Thursday and you didn't know these were available, you might not be able to get them. Well, I mean, you have to get them a few days after everyone else has seen it. Yeah. Avengers Endgame tickets are now on sale. It comes out this month, guys. It This does not feel it like... It broke websites. Oh, it broke multiple websites. Adam, Fandango, 
our Adam tickets, uh, AMC. Draft what? House uh, Dra- went down. Yeah. What's Adam yeah. tickets? Uh, it's a big ticket portal. Really? I went on Fandango right when the tickets went on sale and entered the queue. I mean, it might have been like a couple minutes after. And there was an hour wait because oh there gosh. were so many people in the queue. It was amazing. I'm so pumped. And you, right? These are your people. You couldn't even chat with them. I, oh. oh, imagine what if you What do you mean could, I couldn't in, chat with what? them? Do you know about the rest of the internet? I was with them. <laughs> I mean, in line. You I'm had going, to use Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I had to use Twitter. I'm going to four screenings. Wow. Open. Four screenings in the Four weekend? screenings, and then I'm hosting a fifth. Well, okay, are you doing the 52-hour marathon? 59-hour no, marathon. No, I'm already doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you guys can't see. There's a movie. Play, there's a TV playing uh, Civil War in the background. Are you, I'm doing a full MCU rewatch right now. I'm I like, believe it. Somewhere in like number 10 or somewhere, 10, 12, somewhere there. You're not mm. starting with Ang Lee's Hulk, though? No. Oh, no. Not Ang Lee's Hulk. Why that's would I do that? No, no. It's, it's I not, mean, if not, we're going to do that kind of stuff. It's like, Norton Hulk that's part, unofficially part of the MCU. Gotcha. I'm going to watch like official, the weird but... like Captain America movies from like the <laughs> 1980s or something. No, come that on. could be fun. No. The, the Sony Spider-Man movies, Sam Raimi Spider-Man ones. Are, and... are you seeing all different versions of the film? Opening, opening weekend. Uh, I am. I'm seeing... Uh, uh, I'm seeing one at the Draft House, which is not Jeremy's favorite place, but no, my uh, favorite place. Uh, I'm seeing one in 3D. I'm seeing one in uh, uh, in IMAX, and I'm seeing one in D box. Where are you seeing D box? Uh, down near my work. Hmm, that'll be interesting. Yeah, I'm kind. I'm kind of curious. Tell about me about that. that. I want. I'm curious. IMAX will be good too, right? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. Like, it all depends on this film. Like, the film that I want, IMAX w- shouldn't matter. The film I want is actually about is going to be less about action and punching and, and it's going to be this like those de- like dealing with the loss, which I think is going to be the early part of this film and the sacrifices that are going to be made. That That's what I want to stand out. IMAX doesn't matter as much for, for me. At, that. at three hours and two minutes, they should be able to fit everything in. Yeah, probably. Well, so Marvel announced tickets going on sale with some new footage they put out a one minute long special look which has probably the most footage of characters interacting that we've seen so far and Kishore's right don't watch this there is no need to see it actually I'm not even listening it it it, it gives away moments that you want to experience in the theater for the first time so they just really didn't need to right the, the people are going to buy the tickets no matter totally what. unnecessary um, it was going to be trending on Twitter no matter what. You don't need the memes out now. Uh, but the reason, this is one of those moments. in, in It's an end of an era, first of all. Like they have called this the what the Infinity Era, that the, the first 23 films. The question I have is uh-huh. the movie we know is three, three hours and two minutes long. How long is it in the, the universe? How much time will they will, will go, will, will, will um yeah. Well, tr- they traverse. Aren't most Marvel films pretty much real time? It's like two days. Yeah. Right? It's like most Marvel films. I guess it's not happen, two hours. Right? It's not yeah, two it's hours like, long, but, <laughs> but it's like a short period. Like action right. happens. And like within the span, there's, like, there's some minor travel time. But most of the stuff happens like under a week's period, right? Like things happen quickly, which is why you're, there's a movie about it. Things, no globe scale yeah. being events. It's not like years pass. I'm real curious. Will they break that mold? Yeah. This being the end of an era. Yes. And that characters <laughs> may not survive this at the end of this, and they want to give them real big closure moments. Mm-hmm. Will there be, will it span, you know, months or even years? Yes. I mean, everything <laughs> that you said, yes. I mean, we know they have, like, the suspicion I have, not based on any evidence, just based off of what I think. Yeah. They have to play with time in this movie in order to restore some of the characters that we lost. And so in so doing, if they're going to do it well, they're not going to just MacGuffin it. They're going to, it's going to take the characters a long time to come back from this. And they're playing with time some way. There's probably going to be some form of time travel. So at the end, where we end up might not be far from where we start in terms of the time, but they'll have to traverse a lot of time. I think where they end up may be even further out than we think. Hmm. I don't think it can be just be like the week we spent fighting Thanos and the end of it. Goodbye, these characters. No, I think they might do a reset at the end, though, that gets us back closer to where we are now. 
Will Who, Stanley have a cameo? Will he continue to have cameos? Good question. I think he will have a cameo in this one. I think uh, Kevin Feige Last has one. said that they had shot a few more. Oh, they shot one. They shot some before. They had banked some. Because this movie's been done for over a year. Huh. Well, do you want, this is getting ahead of ourselves, but I'm going to ask it. Who do you want as a, do you want a villain, a new villain to be revealed at the end of this movie? No. Who do you want? No, I don't need a new villain. I do need the seeding of new potential. If it's going to be the end of an era, I would like to see. Some so, what do you want to see? Gra- I, I, well, you want a little X Men. You want a little. That hey. would be too much. I would not contain myself. I, my problem is like I'm not. You know, I, you guys don't know this, but I'm not a huge comic book guy. What? So, but how do you go from Thanos to anybody else? Like Thanos snapped his fingers and killed half the people in the universe. So you got to go to three quarters. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, how is some guy who's how's the Joker going to compare to that? You know, I know a totally different. See, I know, I know it's a totally different thing. But like, what are you going to do? You make Thanos a good guy. You make him an anti-hero. Yeah, that's coming. I think. Um, really? I hope they don't kill him. I really hope because it'll play well for really? someone they're going. Hmm. I'm either hoping for some sort of hint towards Galactus. Oh, the Devourer. Or I think what's going to happen is we'll get a hint towards Kang. Kane? Kang. 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 Like Kang Kong. Kang. <laughs> I, I, I want Kang them to. The I don't think they need cosmic antagonists. Or if they do, relegate those to your Guardians films, to the Eternals. It's okay for the heroes to split up again and go on their separate adventures. But tell some more Earth centric stories. I, I agree with that, but I think I think they are going to be enamored with this. 20 film arc and they're going to try to keep doing that kind of thing maybe not 20 films but they're going to have a big bad that everyone has to come back together for but you don't feel me though that like it's hard to compete with thanos yeah no it is it's it, it, like i don't envy the creative team now and i'm sure they have plans laid out but at yeah. some point the marvel movies will disappoint think about how hard that is in your bathtub full of money to come up with the next idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it will be. It will be a bank teller who will be the villain. It will be bad stock investments. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they could, hope they don't lose touch. They could make they could make somebody we love bad. Like that would be interesting. Uh, People might follow that cuz that, that happens all the time in all comics. All the time in comics. The, the, the it happens all the time in movies, you know. Vin Diesel, now he's the bad guy. He turned Optimus, turned on the other Transformers. Like, yeah, no, we've seen it before. Uh the thing is that Marvel's already announced a slate of other films to come out after Endgame. You, there's one that's coming out this year in uh, in Spider-Man: uh, Far From Home. So uh, this stuff, some of it is already set, right? They've already the seeds are there, and I think the biggest question is going to be how they reconcile their acquisition of the Fox and those characters. I think it's way too soon for us to see any hint of X-Men, Fantastic Four, and I think like th- this. A little gleam off the hint no. of a surfboard? No. no? Oh, surfboard. Space surfboard. <laughs> I think that's going to be most fun with the next um, Deadpool movie because he can draw so many more references now. Yeah, yeah, and that will be its own thing and confirmed as one of the very few, maybe if the only character that will survive this, the, the acquisition uh, in its current form. What about Guardians? Doesn't... No, Guardians is Marvel. Yeah, I know. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought the, you meant the, survive the, 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 the snapping. Yeah, the, no, the, the Fox Disney acquisition, Disney Fox <laughs> acquisition. Uh, and when I say I hope there's a, the tease at the end of Endgame will be a glimmer of hope. I, I mean maybe some of the characters that we've seen established, the younger characters. And, you know, even when we're talking about Captain Marvel, um, the daughter of um, uh, uh, Maria Rambo. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to see like characters that they've laid in the relationships built in and have them take up some mantles. Uh, anyway, uh, we do see a, a new trailer. J- uh, Jeremy mentioned Joker. We have Joker um, top of mind. This was a I set you up for a great segue. Previewed at CinemaCon and now released online. The trailer, first trailer for Todd Phillips' Joker. This film. looks freaking great. This looks like DC is going back to what they're supposed to do, which is be serious. <laughs> Why so serious? <laughs> All right. Are you being facetious? No, you don't think this looks awesome? I think it looks derivative, actually. It looks like derivative. It does. That's how I felt. I felt like it was this director copying oh. some other director's kind of mentality. It felt like a little Scorsese, a little yeah, like... Yeah, great. That's what I... <laughs> give me that. Give me that in my superhero films. It doesn't feel like... It doesn't need to be a superhero film. If you want to tell a dark story about you know, someone yeah. that you don't need to 
call it the Joker. And honestly, I don't want to know the backstory of the Joker. I don't want to empathize with the Joker. Oh, I, wow. You guys are too hard on this. This is this looks good. It, it, to me, the problem was... I think as a ha- movie, it will probably be good. Like, how, yeah. do you go, how do you ever touch Heath Ledger's performance as the Joker? And then, like, you see, don't, this is something that's actually maybe doing that. I really, really, really hope that still... I said this before in the podcast. At the end of this movie, it turns out he's not the Joker. That it's like, it's just one of many Jokers. And it's oh. more of a, this is just a no man. Nobody who we invest in and, and few empathize with and falls down. And, and and then at the end, it's like, well, psych, he wasn't actually the Joker. You're just guessing at this? That's my guess. Okay. Yeah. I think that's actually a, a, a pretty decent guess. I will say, like, when I was watching the trailer, I'm like, is this a trailer for The Master? Haven't we seen this? Right? It's like you hired Joaquin Phoenix to play another, like, tortured soul character. It just looks like another dramatic Joaquin Phoenix right. movie. I'm sorry for being so it's down so on No, it. I mean, we sh- you know why we shouldn't Look. be done? You know why Jeremy's right? Is DC movies have been so bad that this actually probably will not be, as you said. There you go. See, I, that's why I'm right. And if Paul Thomas Anderson directed the superhero movie, I'd go see it in a heartbeat. It'd be fantastic. Yeah, I don't, still, don't, I don't, I don't think it needs to tie to the expectations or the baggage of, a, of an iconic character. But what if... The Joker. What if Wes Anderson directed it? <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> then you're what, in. What about Paul W. S. Anderson directed no. it? No, not interested. No, definitely not interested. Okay, uh, so that's coming out later this year. It's just called Joker, and trailers out. It, it gets a 33 percent tested Rotten Tomato. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Akira, the uh, seminal animated anime that uh, has been. Hollywood has been trying to adapt for many years. Um, may finally have its uh, may, maybe maybe started filming or may may have um, maybe greenlit even or not even. But um, I think the report is it may be moving forward because they the production is looking at filming in California. That's the news, really. Okay. Two so, things are exciting about this. Yeah. Well, three things. First of all, Akira on yeah. film. Yeah. It's pretty damn exciting. Two, there's rumors that Taika Waititi might oh. be attached, which would be amazing. Who's that? Director of Thor Ragnarok and oh. worked on Fly the Concords and all sorts of other Hunt stuff. for the Wilder People. Yeah. What uh, we do in the shadows. shadows. Uh, I'm also excited if they do a, a live action Akira, they mean they have to build the bike. Yeah. Think about like the prop building for this now, movie. Now, hold on. Like, it could be CG. Right? No, come on! Bike. You got to build a bike. If you're going to prop, if you're going to spend money on any props, it you got to build the bike. In Ready Player One, oh, that we see a CG movie. Yeah, a almost wholly CG yeah. movie. I mean, the reason to be skeptical is about how how Ghost in the Shell kind of translated to the screen, um, and and so we should be skeptical. But oh, I'd be excited as hell for this movie. I mean, the trails that's going to be CG. Yeah, light, that's fine, trails. but the bike, you got to build a road I love, bike. I love the bike, dude. I love the bike. Is there a nice model? Is there a kit of the bike you can buy? There is. Yeah, that'd be fun. There's a good 3D printed model. That'd be nice. So the other question I have is how much of this is going to be set in America versus Neo Tokyo and the casting? So is it going to run to the same problems that Ghost in the Shell had, um, that some of the other adaptations have had recently? Um because so much of the film is, uh, the original film is about the city as well, Neo Tokyo, not just the characters. Uh, but I trust Taika Waititi. I, I believe he, he loves this franchise, or he loves this, this manga and loves the anime, and I'd love to, just to see the film happen. Uh, speaking of Taika Waititi, did you guys see What We Do in the Shadows, the American version on FX? I've only watched one episode. I've watched the first episode as well. I like it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's good. Yeah. It, like it, it, I still think the movie was better just because it's contained. It really feels like what they did with The Office with the British version, yeah. and the American version. This is an American version, but with some with British actors, you know, with not just American actors. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, What We Do in the Shadows, highly recommended. So it's good. It's a documentary about vampires living in a modern world, in that case, in uh, Wellington, uh, New Zealand. Um, and not to go into spoilers, but they go, they meet other supernatural forces. It's a pure comedy. And now FX has a show that's basically that same story with some different twists on characters that's set in the uh, Northeast, in the North Atlantic. And uh, the first episode's very funny. Directed by Taika Waititi, first episode. Also written by uh, Jeremy Clement. Uh, speaking of new TV, 
Oh, I don't know if we can call it the TV. CBS All Access. Twilight Zone is back. Jordan mm-hmm. Peele's Twilight Zone. Uh, the first two episodes are out on CBS. And the first episode actually is free to watch on YouTube. So anyone can watch. I watched it. How'd you like it? It was okay. It was okay. It was okay. It's tough. It felt Twilight Zony. It did not feel different enough. And I think we may be spoiled with so many great anthology, science fiction anthology series like Black Mirror, like the Philip K. Dick stories, um, that the, I know they didn't, aren't trying to do the same. They're not trying to be commentary the same way Black Mirror is trying to be commentary. They're trying to be Twilight Zone. And if you want more Twilight Zone-esque feel, this one felt like it, but it just didn't feel different enough. Did, and just by the by, did either of you see Us? I did not. No. Not yet. I keep hearing amazing things, but I, I'm trying to a- avoid any spoiler. I'm a coward. I can't watch that in theaters. It's way too scary for me. Uh, but go ahead. Watch uh, the first episode of Twilight Zone. The Comedian. It stars um, Kumail Nanjani uh, as the uh, the comedian, a stand-up comedian. Um, and uh, Tracy Morgan's in it. And it's it's a good self-contained story. Yeah, it's beautifully shot. The rest of the series sounds really interesting. Some stories are apparently riffs on classic Twilight Zone stories um, with callbacks, but their own modern twists. I think the second episode is Adam Scott in a take on the uh, the terror at, um, what is it, terror at 3,000 feet, 10,000 feet, uh, the William Shatner yeah. story. Famous episode, also part of the movie. All right, John Lithgow. Right, right. The thing about Twilight Zone is that the original series holds up 100%. I don't know when the last time is you guys watched those, but I've been watching them again with my son and along with um, Alfred Hitchcock, Hitchcock Presents, mm. two wonderful black and white series. Oh my God, like they're all good. They're all And they're inventive and they are, you don't know what you're in for. Am I gonna be scared? Am I gonna, am I gonna laugh? They're, they're weird. weird. Yeah. One of the words that they, <laughs> a, a uh, adjective I, I don't like. Um, yeah, and I don't know if, I, mean, I got to watch the rest of this to see if they have that same feel throughout, uh, the unexpectedness. I think some people watch Twilight Zones for a twist at the end. Yeah. And not all of them are twists at the end. They just mm. have a twisty premise. Twisty. Yeah. Uh, a trailer for a movie that came out, uh, is coming out, is The Dead Don't Die. Have you oh, guys seen this the, trailer? Is this the Bill Murray? This is Bill Murray starring, and it is... Uh, well, everyone's in it. Well, oh yeah, also. Go oh, go. Oh. Yeah. That's not me this time. <laughs> that was me. Uh, it's Bill Murray, Adam Driver, Tilda Swinton, um, Steve Buscemi, uh, Chloe Sevigny, uh, Danny Glover. It's so many, so many people. Everyone's in it. It's written and directed by uh, Jim uh, Jarmusch. Who's that? He did Coffee and Cigarettes. Do you remember that movie? Cigarettes and Coffee. Cigarettes, no. and, is it cigarettes and coffee? No, it's coffee, coffee and cigarettes. cigarettes. Don't, don't confuse me, Jeremy. No, I, th- I think that the uh, the Boogie Nights, the title of the student project that's based on was Cigarettes and Coffee. Oh. I'm just saying, I thought that was funny. So uh, he did Coffee and Cigarettes. He also did this great vampire film from a couple years back with Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston uh, called Only Lovers Left Alive, I want to say. Hmm. But he's a very eclectic uh, writer-director. Um and oh Tom Waits is in this too and so what a cast yeah I mean sign me up this looks fantastic and I hate zombie films how about the the Rizzas in this yeah great there you well go. that's no surprise like Bill Murray and here best friends what yeah Bill Murray's friends with a member of the Wu Tang Clan yeah isn't that isn't that like a known thing apparently not yeah I don't know and of course he worked with Bill Murray previously on the film Broken Flowers which is oh okay. Uh, so very, uh, I think if you're talking about a film that is a, almost a comedic take on zombie films well, the, with also well, meta-awareness. Zombieland kind of. Exactly. Thing. I, I didn't like Zombieland. I yeah. think I will like this because this will be a more satirical take than, than Zombieland. And Bill Murray's in it more. And Bill Murray stars in this one. I don't know. I'm kind of zombie. See, I, I feel like I'm not a huge Adam Driver fan. and like So I'm wondering how he's going to affect my enjoyment of this film. You what? Yeah. What? <laughs> what, what? 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 From just from Star Wars? You don't like him because of Kylo Ren? I really don't like him because of Kylo Ren, but I think I never really enjoyed him otherwise. Like he was. A, he, there's another movie that he's in. Black I, Klansman. I never. I have not seen that yet. Uh, what about? Uh, he was in Girls, of course, the TV show. 
Yeah, some, that was kind of a some, breakout. Some music film. Uh, Lucky Logan. He was in the uh, the high school. That film. was good. Yeah, that's good. He's that's he's. You guys are big Adam Driver fans. No, but the, <laughs> yes. that movie was yes. good. I will say yes. <laughs> Uh, he's gonna be in the um, the Terry Gilliam film, "Man Who Killed Don Quixote." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just don't buy him quite so much. All right then, we know where you we'll stand see. on Adam, on Adam Driver. <laughs> Whatever, I'm sure he cares. Give him the benefit of the doubt. And our last bit of pop culture news, a little bit of cross uh, with science, is Burger King. <laughs> Burger King. So, is this a thing now? Because I think Carl's Jr. started also with their meatless burger. We've seen tons of ads they for They have those. a Beyond Meat burger. Beyond Meat is a company they're working with for burgers uh, in everywhere now, right? It's na- nationwide. I don't uh, know if it's nationwide, but at least it's West a lot Coast. of places. Yeah. Um, and Burger King has partnered with Impossible Foods, mm-hmm. which we've tasted their burgers previously only available in certain restaurants. And, but usually much more expensive than Beyond. Yes, they started on the high end, uh, but now it's in in uh, St. Louis area, mm-hmm. uh, they're putting the Whopper uh, released as a meatless burger. And so they had initially started with White Castle and some sliders. And uh, have you, either of you, had the Impossible 2.0? No. No. It is good. It is, it is a lot better um, than I, the 1.0. What makes it better? It just tastes better. Like, I mean, so like flavor? I don't know. <laughs> like, because uh, what struck is better. I've only had it once, and what struck me was that it has everything to do with how it's prepared. That the oh, saltiness 100%. and the flavor has as much to do with the grill and the chef as it does with the meat. 100%. And the Whopper is going to taste like all the crap that's on top of the Whopper, anyways, right? Right. So I feel like I've never had a, like a Burger King burger, though I will give a shout out. Burger King has these like higher end burgers that actually are pretty good. Higher end burgers? Yeah, like ones that are like thicker, like Kenji swears by them. How do you get that? Uh, they just, you go to a Burger King is mm-hmm. a good start. <laughs> they have like... Uh, <laughs> and you, uh, you order a high end Whopper? No, but it's like, um, it's some sort of like artisan created burger. Okay. Um I wonder but how it, how much this is going to cost. I'm if, sure it's going to be like, you know. Uh, is it ten, is it a $10 Whopper? 1.5x the normal Whopper. I mean, price. that's not Impossible's game though. They've always been much more expensive. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I'm excited about this. This has a chance to make a big dent. Um and frankly, this is one of those places where it doesn't matter like if it if if the Impossible Burger tastes like ninety percent of a normal burger, are you going to notice it in a Whopper? This thing's great. They should re- they should get, uh, serve this to people and not tell them when they order the regular Whopper. For people that don't know, by the way, people yeah. will sue them. Yeah, people for, people will sue like, for anything. People will hate like <laughs> people who who eat meat. How dare you? <laughs> it tastes great, but how dare you? Yeah. Just one quick shout out, Pat Brown, who founded Impossible Foods. Uh, founded PLOS, the Public Library of Science, which was one of the first open access journals out there, and invented DNA microarrays. He's like an incredibly accomplished scientist, and he's like, screw academia. I'm going to make a better burger. Good for him. Follow the money. No, I don't think he's trying to change the world. <laughs> I, I'm so curious. I really want this to go nationwide. I'm curious about the supply chain. Just so you too. can try it. <laughs> well, yeah, so it can try it, but also so that it can be more widely available. Sure. And I am curious if this, let's say it's not a breakout success, but they do want to keep it at Burger King as an option. Yeah. Like, can supply chain work for this? Like, can, can Burger King store and, like, enough and... Because you know, they go through so much material. Eventually, it has to come down to the same price as the Whopper. Yeah. You can't have a Whopper and a different Whopper that tastes the same as the Whopper, but cost a lot more. Well, this is scale. I mean, this is what it takes to get impossible costs down far enough. Like, certainly Burger King is it. And we'll get vegetarians and vegans into Burger King. Think of the cows. I, it, it, the question is, are they aiming for that, or are they aiming for people who just want to be more... Both socially conscious, environmentally conscious. Oh, you think they want meat lovers to try something different? Exactly. I think that's actually the bigger play. That Not- is, the, the, in, in the end, that, that, and there are many more meat lovers than there are vegetarians. That's how you're going to change the world. Is getting those people to try this. Maybe not go completely vegan and go vegetarian, but to have this be a viable regular option, as opposed to your standard ground beef burger. Why? Why do that? Because it's more sustainable for the cows. For the world. For the world. For the world. And it's not like I'm never going to have a steak. I will have a steak, but you know, if I'm craving a burger, maybe I'll have the Impossible Burger instead. Yeah. If, if they cost exactly the same, why not? Yeah. 15% less um, fat and 90% less cholesterol than a standard Whopper. 
so healthier, technically. Too. Mm. Well, if you get the fries with it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, right, right. According to according to Impossible Foods. Uh, all right, that does it for pop culture news. And before we move on to tech, I want to thank the sponsor that makes this episode of the Solonia Test possible, and that's MailChimp. MailChimp is an easy-to-use marketing platform with a name that might make it sound like they only do email. But they do just about everything to help businesses grow with email ads, postcards, landing pages, audience management tools, automations reports, and more. You'll know you're doing marketing right because growth looks different to everyone. So MailChimp helps guide you make the right marketing decisions for your business. You can create a customer list, connect an online store, test an email variation, or analyze a marketing report. MailChimp understands business owners would rather focus on their past rather than focus on marketing. So they automated the marketing process to make it easier for you to get back to doing what you love. MailChimp started by doing just email marketing, but now they do so much more. You could say they outgrew their name and now their marketing tools can help you do the same. Go to MailChimp.com and sign up for free and see how MailChimp can grow your business. MailChimp, they do more than mail. Well, we have that big Apple news last week. What do we got left over? Oh, some more Apple news. I just, no, I just I went into a store and I purchased a set of the new AirPods. AirPod Two, yeah, for, for your mom. For my mom. Yep. You and about on this, the yep. box, it yep. says it's compatible with the upcoming AirPower. Oh, yeah, no, uh, which no. I'm very excited about. <laughs> yeah, everyone, everyone too. Uh, well, sorry, <laughs> but AirPower is canceled. <laughs> That was fast. No, it wasn't fast. It took them a, almost a year and a half. They, when did they for, come up with the packaging for those AirPods? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm sure that was abrupt. Yes. But it's been a drawn yes. out announcement and and teasing of this product since they first revealed it, along with the iPhone ten. But the charging mat that's air power and presumably my dream of a fully chargeable charging desk where I can just put a phone and 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 AirPods and laptop you can everywhere. You still do that. Well, you can hack your like phone with a key G charger. The technology that they want to do, that they want to put in their charge pad, where you can put the devices anywhere, yeah. uh, did not work. And so it th- could be down to physics. There are competing charge pads. Well, no, no longer competing. There are alternative uh, charge pads where that do support putting your watch and your uh, AirPods, the new AirPods, and the phone. And they all charge, but they use different coils for each device. And I guess so, Apple wanted to do it all with one. Right. Well, not one coil, but wanted it to act essentially like one large coil by Got stacking it. the coils. Ah. So then there's a physics problem with There that. is a physics problem because – so the way it's, – it's a Qi charger. If you, if you buy one of those Qi chargers, the open standard, and you look – it is literally a, a, a coil, right? And it's – you don't get a lot of power throughput, but it does work just by – contact and over very thin services you know energizers invested in it you can find them in starbucks even uh but like you said you have to align the receptor with the transmitter pretty much on top of each other to get good throughput it's a bit like an nfc tag so yeah. if you ever swipe a tag near something, it has to be pretty close. Yes, and Apple did not want to put a product out where they had like dotted outlines for here's where you put your phone, here's where you put your AirPod. They wanted people to, for it to just work. See, s- I suspect that they, if you're doing multiple coils, the physics they can't get aware, away from is that all has to generate heat. Not only heat, but interference with each yeah. other. As the coils stack, your efficiencies decrease. And so you have the, the way to compensate for that is the... Up the voltage of po- yeah. the power, and that's where you have your heat problems. And I don't think they really wanted exploding charge uh, air pa- or whatever they called these um, uh, air power devices no. in the wild. No. So it did not meet their uh, rigorous standards, is what they said. And you don't so- see this from Apple, though. This is very odd for them to reveal a product that fails before release. Well, not only that, but reveal a product that itself in concept was going to be a backbone for a whole platform of technologies that already is now seeded in products in release on the phone, in the AirPods, presumably on the roadmap, if this had worked in other devices, 
if this is gone, the most basic thing, right, the thing that connects it all together for power, then their dream of a untethered world. Of a portless device. Portless device could be kaput. Well, they'll release some other basic charger, don't you think? No. You don't I mean, think? you think they would, it would be, okay. They, they could. They, they ship could. the watch with one. They could, and maybe they should, but now the cancellation of air power casts this shadow over anything else they Ooh. they put over. Yeah. And, and no one's going to be able to talk about it you know, without referencing the failure. They can't was. release a portless device without their own charger. They have to. Oh, yes, of course. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if, presumably, if an iPhone ever came out without a connector for charging, yeah. one, people would riot, people would complain, but two, you would need to have a charger that bundled. Yeah. Really? How's your headphone jack doing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, people are still very the much thing, rioting, like, and that iPad mini does have The thing have is, a most jack. CarPlay implementations require a cable. Like, that's one thing I couldn't imagine they re- would remove it at this point for. What if it's but, just Bluetooth? Yeah, why can't it be Bluetooth? No, because CarPlay doesn't support Bluetooth. The only wireless CarPlay implementation is on BMWs. And what standard is that? Oh, it pro- might use Bluetooth for that, but so it's just a certification thing. Y- Apple could just bully them. Well, sure, but then all car of the existing CarPlay, in, you know, in, installations would stop working. Right, That's, unless you had a dongle. Unless you had like a, <laughs> a, dongle. a wireless a dongle. Wire- Here's yeah. a proprietary wireless dongle that will plug in oh USB into your car. You leave it hidden in your dash. Yep. And then when you put your bring your phone in, it will seamlessly pair using an H1 chip or a W2 chip, whatever it's built into your AirPods. Next week, Norm won't there be here go. because Apple will have hired him <laughs> for this dongle idea. <laughs> dongle, brilliant. Brilliant. Now your Chevy Bolts won't need to have an extra cable inside of it because cables are of the past. Uh, it also moves away from what other phone manufacturers are leaning into, which is high voltage, very quick charge, very fast charge, uh, being a big selling point of the Galaxy Notes it, uh, uh, and, and the, uh, the Galaxy phones and even the, the LG phones. Having that Qualcomm quick charger in your phones is a big thing because people use their phones more and more. It's like adding lanes to a freeway. You can add more lanes, but traffic is just going to be as congested. You can build up the capacity of your phones Give it more battery life, but people are just going to do more things on it. And so people are always going to want f- faster charging, higher capacity batteries, because they can't help but be on their phones. Really? Yeah. I, feel, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like people are already... I mean, are there people that use up their batteries in a day? Yes. As it is? Really? Easily. Yes. Wow. Okay. That, I guess I'm just... That's not my world. And you know, and I'm sure Apple, with the thing like a screen time, yeah. you know, wants to make people aware and of their usage, and they want to promote a, a balanced life, right? A very holistic uh, uh, look at technology. Yeah. No, people they make money when people use their phones, and people buy apps, when people download movies and and, and music, and people can't help themselves. I, I will say, older phones certainly the batteries die, and there's everyone needs a battery pack if you've got like a two or three year old phone. Yeah, we're never going to get away from the era of the battery pack and and people wanting their phones to charge faster. Yeah, and wireless, unfortunately, contact uh, charging is not the way to do it. Tesla tried to do it. Tesla, the dream of te- not the company Tesla, the man Tesla was wireless charging. He could never get it to work. The dream of it, you know. Of, of, of a device being charged and running on power without being connected to anything. And it's I think it just goes down to physics. Uh, so from air power, uh, how about uh, some robots? Uh, Boston Dynamics, you see this video, has a new robot. Yep, very cool. Very cool. Looks looks like a, less like a dog, more like an, an ostrich? Yes. Yes, this this robot is... It's a like a really interesting advanced segue in that it balances on two wheels and drives itself around. It, it looks like it uses its own weight in order to get started in different directions. I'm sure it has motors on the wheels as well, but its job is to move boxes from one area of the room to another and stack them in order and in a nice organized fashion on another platform. And it's uh, it does a good job at that. Yeah, its head seems to be some sort of like suction type mechanic where it can grab hold of a box. What was impressive to me was that it was able to uh, process like multiple SKUs and stack like a pallet with different types of boxes. Oh, I didn't get that. that. So that's computer vision. That's that's the intelligence part of it. The physics part of this makes you wonder if this type of robot will ever be practical because it seems like it needs to be that big one to balance itself and also to lift things 
that heavy. Well, the alternative is to have a a build up a, a robot that takes up that space with the entire infrastructure of a platform. And then then like I went to the Jelly Belly factory a month ago and they're doing that. Mm -hmm. But you're not putting anything else in that robot space unless right. you dismantle the robot. This you put to work on a concrete slab and it can just do it. It works in existing factories, exactly. in existing warehouses. You know, the real alternative is just to let people do it also and not necessarily invent yeah. ways to right. but take they, those jobs away from people. But they create unions. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm going to leave that <laughs> without comment. Uh, all right. Uh, going on to um, other stories, big thing for uh, Facebook. Facebook is finally um, banning uh, white nationalism pages. And I think Mark Zuckerberg uh, has, has now talk, been a little more open about uh, Facebook being open to the idea of some regulation because I think it's something that, not, not that it's not possible to do, but now that uh, it can become inevitable. And so to level the playing field and make sure every other network has some regulation as well, maybe he'll help set the standard for that. Um, it, it, I think it, it, we think of Facebook as a company that's been around forever, but it's only been around for, what, 15, 15 years? Mm -hmm. And like it's still very early like facebook is a, there's a, in social media and and networks in, in in general like these these big companies there's a lot to grow and, and and a lot to um and a lot of maturity to happen well i mean i, I commend this decision absolutely and i hope that the other social networks follow through with it uh with with similar actions but they were their hand was pushed on this one because of what happened in christchurch new zealand and he streamed that horrible massacre onto Facebook live. And, you know, so they they were forced to deal with this. And maybe, you know, that this should have happened sooner, but I'm glad to see it happening now. They always had um, had restrictions against um, uh, certain, against racism, but now they're including white nationalism and separatism. Mm. So good, mm. great. Uh, moving on, Teslas are being tricked. The computer vision system on Teslas, on their autopilot system, being tricked, not tricked out, but being fooled uh, by some uh, reflective tape. This is a, there's a really long video. Um, some researchers from, from China, like, really tried to delve into how Tesla's system recognizes uh, the, the road markings and, like, centers itself in lanes and how it makes turns. And it's not just like a, a simple path. It makes multiple decisions about recognizing like edges and the masking on edges and then mapping itself on this grid. So it goes through this series of things. But what they found is once you understand the processes, the decisions it's making on this tree, you can create fake markings on the road just by placing a certain type of sticker down that's of a certain size that has this kind of blurring on its edges that can fake it. What's interesting was that these stickers, they said, wouldn't even phase a human driver. That the human driver might not even notice these stickers. Right. Yeah. But the car thinks, oh, that's a line telling me I need to go in the, to the adjacent lane. And the scary thing about the current artificial intelligence is that it doesn't know that the adjacent lane is going the opposite direction. Yes. And I don't think this is surprising. We've seen videos of these computer vision systems being fooled by people placing down cones and uh, other sorts of markers. And the bigger issue is how the expectation of how the world should adapt to car, uh, autonomous cars versus how autonomous cars need to adapt to the world. Like, Is it regulation that will help solve this problem? Because they're not going to get around people if, they wanna if, if terrorists want to create chaos. Uh, they can on autonomous systems because there is no real way to have the intelligence to be as smart as what a human can understand, right? Like they're all kind of shortcuts in using using um, um, the trust of the, the built-in infrastructure. Like w what do you guys think is the solution to this? So how, how, I mean. With time and engineering. Like, you think time and engineering could potentially solve this? Some like just. Well, certainly solve, I think they, they could solve this problem in a week. Uh, but there's going to be a, a hundred other ones mm -hmm. that they have to solve as well. And yeah, we're just in the early days. I feel like we're a lot earlier in the days than Tesla advertises. I right. agree with that. And this is going to be part of the norm is like there, there'll be a next exploit and a one after that and one after that. I mean, that's what we've seen in other industries. So why wouldn't the same be true for 
for this one. And presumably the systems get smarter because there'll be more cars on the road. And, you know, if someone was to implement an exploit, a physical exploit like this, it would be uh, a very rare case, right? It would be an outlier. And those outliers presumably, presumably get phased out or not taken into account when uh, other cars, If you know, if there are 100 Tesla cars driving down a road that don't see this and one does because uh, someone has put that marker down, it would trust the other 99 cars rather than trust what it sees potentially being a wrong thing. So maybe, maybe that's that's the solution. But yeah, like, I, 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 you know, these are not systems we should trust right now. They People. should be uh, systems yeah. that we you, you can use to um, to to complement your existing driving, but you should always be in charge. Keep your hand on the wheel. Keep your eyes on the road. And and click that OK button to waive your liability. Uh, uh, two pieces of Android news. Okay. One that is infuriating. And yes. One that's interesting. Gmail is awesome. Uh, well, should we start with infuriating? Inbox is dead. It's not quite dead. Like we got three more days here. What? Yeah, it still works for the first week of of what, what month are we in? April. No, it's forcing me to go to Gmail. Oh, really? It, it told me I had like three more days. What? Why is he special? Google. Yeah. Let's see. I can go there right now. Oh, yeah, inbox God. still working, but it's <laughs> apparently. Oh, the, you mean just the desktop version? That's no, my app still works. And I love it. I love it. I now know. I'm even more mad. I don't know what they're thinking. It's such a superior interface. Is just, it? just watching the flood of users just complain about it. And how can you choose April Fool's Day as the <laughs> day that yeah. the app expires? That felt mean. You know, I just don't get it. Like, there must be people at Google who use it, who prefer it, right? Like a, a I, large it's number be of people. the ads in Gmail. Yeah. Right? Is that it? it? It's a money thing? It's got to be. Oh, my God. Uh, all right. So let us... Pour one out for Inbox. The other is kind of interesting. So Duplex has been officially turned on. This is that assistant feature we saw at I.O. Um, Book a haircut. Yeah, where you can use AI to make a phone call and book something where the AI will physically talk to uh, a person on the other end and then it seem, it occurs as a seamless transaction. It, initially, they weren't going to disclose that it was a bot and then people were up in arms and they said yeah. they would. I haven't tried it yet, but it has been enabled. So, because I can't think of what I'm going to try this for. Like, what should I book? I, I was like racking my brain this morning thinking about like, what is a thing that I have to call for? Well, why don't you have it call Norm and schedule a podcast? No, because it does it through the AI. It has to pick up that this is a thing. In Google's database for, that's categorized as restaurant for I just can't make it mm. call you with an AI voice. Which is good. I think that's a good like exploit. That it, it they're a good uh, constraint. All right, you could call make a restaurant make a restaurant reservation. Make a reservation where my wife works. No, uh, but don't they do online reservations there? Yeah. So then it won't let me. Oh, really? Yeah. It force it will make the choice for you to do the booking the way that the restaurant actually wants you to do it. So if it has an online system, it'll try to do that first. Oh, and then itself. resort to the phone call. How oh, funny. Okay. Yeah, that's tricky. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to be a haircut. <laughs> and Google's only trained this really to book reservations. This yeah. is not no other task that you can do. And presumably they will uh, train to do other things, but Duplex, uh, they want to focus on getting it right. And you do need uh, the Google Pixel, uh, although... Um, no, it's Android 5 this, and up. Android 5 and up and, and iPhones as well with uh, the Google Assistant app. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's worth worth testing. Are you going to test it? I would, let's come up with a good good use case. Let's come up with a... Get your dog a vet appointment. Ooh. Good one. Well, they no, restaurant. I think they only do like restaurant reservations oh, right now. Really? Yeah. That's it? See if they could do my, like a dentist or something like that. That would be awesome. Yeah. Like a medical <laughs> appointment where I don't want to be on the phone with these people. Um, one last tech story that I was super interesting. There's this long form piece and Wired about it this week is that the government of Estonia has been slowly switching to using much more tech in their um, everyday government pattern. So like there's a national ID issued in Estonia and you use that to vote and you essentially like swipe your card to gain rights to voting. Well, one of the things they've done is for small claims, $7,000 or less, they now have a system where an AI judge will actually rule on the case. And it's so fascinating that they're doing it as an efficiency. And the reason they expanded to this is one of the 
things the government regulates um, is with farmers is like maintaining their their land as part of like this government aid agreement. So instead of having, they used to have to have inspectors go out and make sure they were doing that. Now they use satellite imagery to check if the land has been mowed and maintained. And if it doesn't get maintained according to satellite imagery, or uh, they send an automated note uh, to the to the farmer just by email, and then if the if it's occluded for some reason, then the inspector goes, and the government saves something like um, a half million dollars in expenses of inspectors going out to locations just by using this satellite imagery last year, and so they take took that success and is now applying it to essentially small claims court. It's awesome, and uh, and this isn't like a new thing. Even in the U.S., there are algorithms that look at recidivism rates um, in uh, in courts uh, that's sort of behind the scenes, a little more proprietary. Um, but I think this is fascinating use of technology. Slippery slope to RoboCop from that point, though. Isn't he judge, jury, and executioner? Wasn't that a judge that's dread? That's just dread. That's dread? Yeah. I, you Ro- know what? RoboCop follows the law. I never saw I'm sorry, dread. he is the law. That's yeah. just dread. Judge dread's the law. Okay. You never saw which one? Still Any one? of them. So it, RoboCop, he was just the cop. He was then. just the cop. Just cop. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Although... Did kind of act like a jury and executioner. Made a few, made a few decisions. Made a few decisions. <laughs> Human brain, cyborg body. Yeah. Oh, last piece of tech news uh, for the 3D printing world. Surprise, the Form 3 is announced. This is the SLA printer from Form Labs, and the Form 2 has been a very reliable, trusted, as high end SLA printer for people who do prop builds or uh, model making. And now, and, and you know, even in uh, for making false teeth and, and practical industrial uses, mm-hmm. uh, the Form 3 and the Form 3L, which is a very, as you can imagine, a larger Form 3, uh, looks slightly different. And the big thing is that the, uh, they re-engineered their approach. They use a laser-based curing system um, and, and a pool of resin, but the pool itself is a, be- is a, is a, a tray, and the tray is now f- what they call a flexible tray. And so it allows you to do much finer layers. They call it flawless prints. But the um, the uh, the uh, support structures, where the supports touch your prints, can now be extremely fine. Oh, so it's easier to break off. Very easy to break off, and less of the residue, less cleanup. Less cleanup on That's your nice. prints. Yeah, it starts at thirty five hundred dollars, and the three L is ten thousand dollars. <laughs> but you can print like a whole helmet. In the 3L, which is massive. All right, you're getting one? No, I don't think we're getting a, a 3L, yeah. but we'd love to review the, the 3. Uh, and they'll begin shipping in uh, June, the 3 at least, with the 3L going uh, toward the end of the year. Uh, the Form 2 is, will still be on sale. It gets a little cheaper, and now it'll be uh, 2800 But if you're if it's going to be like a seven $600 difference, you're going to spend that you know in the first couple of years of printing uh, just in trays and, and resins anyway. Um, so we can't wait to review it. I think the, the build platform, is a, the build volume is a little bit bigger as well. Uh, we can find all that information on uh, the Formlabs website. Now it's time for a moment of science. So just a few short stories this week. Uh, I've talked about robot swarming uh, a number of times on this podcast. Uh, A set of researchers did something interesting. They had these like small robots do swarming mechanics, but wanted to have some ability for humans to wrangle them. The idea of robot swarms is with simple instructions, uh, simple capabilities of uh, of these robots and ability to communicate with each other, you can have emergent complicated patterns form. But you still want to have some sort of like human interaction with them in some way. So they just basically created a VR system with Magic Leap on the, or not Magic Leap, um, Leap, Leap Motion, Motion on the front, uh, where they were visual, you, they created sort of visualization of where all of these swarm robots were. And then using hand gestures from the Leap Motion, you're able to actually pull them, rearrange them, give each individual robot instructions. And it tended up it tended to be much more intuitive of a control system than any sort of like regular computer interface to them. So what they found is like now they're using this to actually more quickly deploy uh, and re um, uh, redirect robot swarms. 
Now, like the use case for this, they always say like search and rescue, like with every every sort of like robot technology. Um, but I thought it was a cool connection to actually use VR in a simplified way to actually control lots of devices all at the same time. I never thought that as a use case for VR. Cool. Um, we always thought that neurons stop forming after adolescence. There's a thing called neurogenesis that ends essentially after you become, you know, somewhere, people debate this, but somewhere around like 20, 21, uh, you start developing new neurons. Um, you well, stop developing, right? Yeah. Okay. So there's no new neurons in, that emerge in, from your brain. There's been some um, examinations recently that is pretty controversial. We actually don't know the answer to this. Mm -hmm. um, that said, the reason we don't see new neurons is how we've been measuring if new neurons were developing. And the technique that has often been used uses sort of like a, a formaldehyde to essentially sort of break apart brain tissue and sort of see um, what what like the cellular structure is. And so their hypothesis was, is by using that, we actually are destroying the new neurons that are developing before we actually visualize. How them. ironic. And so they actually, out of um, uh, 13 adults that were aged 40 to 80, uh, they used this new technique to find an indicator of, of uh, developing neurons. Uh, by looking for this particular protein out of tissue from the hippocampus, which is like this area deep within our, our brain. And they found signs of 42,000 on average immature neurons per square millimeter of brain tissue. So showing that there were new neurons developing in even in these older adults. It was just growing at a much lower rate than what we saw in adolescence. This is highly controversial. Um, a lot of Neuroscientists say that that finding isn't accurate, like looking for that protein that's being expressed, that all neurons like um, uh, exhibit that. But if this turns out to be true, this changes what we think. You that can teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. Well, you can do that lots of ways. You can get smarter when you're older. Yeah, but the fact that new neurons will be developing, the really interesting part is that with stuff like Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, we see a massive decline in that rate hmm. of um, of development. I thought it was one of those, like, we don't know, um, shrug shoulders emoji stories in science, which I don't always see. Lastly, I don't know what to think of this, but next week, April 10th, mm -hmm. there is a joint announcement from six different institutions and the European Science Commissioner is going to be at one. And they're presenting initial results from something called the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a telescope that's been pointed at a black hole. And every indication is they're going to return the first image from the edge of a black hole, of, a, of the edge of a black hole. I don't know how. I don't know what. Like, that's a supposition. But uh, April 10th, my Twitter feed and science feeds across the world are going to blow up <laughs> with this so wait a minute. idea. So it, we know where black holes are because, right? There's we, we can see nothing. Gabillions black holes and everywhere. Why, so what do you, if we get a really good lens and we zoom in on that black hole, we can see nothing next to stars. But light, uh, the gravity in black holes is so strong that yeah. light is bent. Right. By it. So there's this gravitational lensing effect that oftentimes happens where light is bent. So we can reconstruct where black holes are. Now, I don't know what they mean by an image coming from this telescope and how that actually works with this, but the idea is they somehow uh, reconstructed the light emanating from material at the edge of a black hole, like at the event horizon. I don't know. <laughs> they haven't made the announcement yet, I'm just saying. That sounds exciting, man. It's different. The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. Well, we talked about the index, so not a ton of other stuff to talk about in VR. We are, of course, in the Oculus Quest countdown period, or when we're in the springtime. And so developers are announcing uh, games coming out for Quest, and we talked about some of this last week. Yeah, but at, Central. at PAX, they announced some that we didn't talk about. Oh, such as? Um... Uh, well, I put you. I thought you put them here. I did not put them here. Uh, now you ex uh, now expected to die. 
some existing games. Uh, Vacation Simulator? Vacation Simulator, yes. Um, and... Oh, look. You can you can keep talking. Well, I'm going to jump to our next and maybe last VR story then. What? Dave, Dave. Well, I mean, No Man's Sky is announced. I don't think we talked about that. Is for, that for, for, VR. for No, it's not for Quest. No, no, no we, we did talk about we that. We did talk about yeah, that? That okay. was a state of play. Okay. Yeah, the PlayStation. I'm excited for that. Yes. Yes. Us, me too. Um, yeah. Do, do, do. You got Super Hot. You got Space Pirate Trainer. Oh, Dead yeah. and Buried 2. Those are, those are two of them. Yeah. Super, Super Hot and Space Pirate Trainer. We did not know about those last week. Yes. I mean, that's huge. Plus, like, uh, well, Rec Room was announced. These are like major staple PC I, games. I feel like we talked about this on, on the podcast. We, last did, week. we didn't talk. I don't think so. Oh. And it's, I mean, these all these games are coming from PC. I mean, any one of these games would have been like a, maybe not a killer app, but like a big game I would have definitely put first person or uh, first time VR users into to experience VR. And they're coming to a portable device. I think the thing that, that is notable. And I think it's we're beginning to see that in this 50 title launch lineup that Quest will have as Oculus keeps announcing these, significant portion of them will be existing content that we saw on previous devices. That's like, been ported down. That's been ported down. Yeah. We saw screenshots with the trailer of Robo Recall, for Robo example, Recall. being ported. And they, they made that announcement before, but now we saw a glimpse and yeah. Epic Games put a picture of what it looks like. And to run it on a mobile processor, they had to turn down some of the effects, and it won't near, look nearly as good as it does on the PC. But if the gameplay is there, yeah, um, it's fine because they're treating this for really. They're treating this like a, a, a second try and at the Rift look, Touch I, launch. I was prepared for Oculus Go level graphics from what I've seen. Yeah, from Beat Saber. Uh, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna look fine. Things are gonna look good. What we've seen from Robo Recall is it's gonna look way better than you could do on Go. Yep. Um, I think Job Sim should probably be pretty close. To, to the PC experience because that's a pretty low poly experience. Really, question mark or question is uh, battery life. Is how, how long can you play these games? Yes. And what the battery pack situation is going to be with USB C on the side? Can will people be mounting battery packs to their their belts? And so to be in quest, you longer, can't play plugged in. You can with uh, you the can. go and yeah. the, with the C now on the quest. I would think it's You'd, even more voltage. So. I would think so. I would so much rather be tethered with a plug than have a battery pack strapped to me. I don't know about tethered that. Tethered with a plug. Te- tethered to a computer. That's what you mean, right? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you can play plugged in, right? Oh, to a computer? But mm-hmm. you want rooms, you want to walk around. You want to yeah. be, be you But you be can free. get a long-ass cord. Long-ass cord. No, no, you don't want cords at all. Give me a battery pack. Yeah. Uh, Dave & Buster's has another location-based VR experience. You did the Jurassic Park one. I would hardly call that a location-based experience. It and was on location, but it was a chair. <laughs> with four seats? But yeah, it was like a roller coaster chair. And that is what this is as well. The same company that made that. They're basically, Dave & Buster's is bringing in more VR games, but using their existing platform of these four chairs and basically VR roller coasters that are themed, in this case, to Star Trek. So it's not, unfortunately, what we all hoped for, which was like some type of tactile bridge that you're you know, yeah. working at. Give me that. But no, this is four people on a chair holding Vive wands as all, phasers. All working together. All working together to fire at the viewfinder. You're Will not, it be like two minutes, too? It's, you know, limited time. You are not on the Enterprise. You are on the USS Galileo which is the Federation's latest and greatest starship. You were hoping That sounds to... like a ship that gets destroyed in battles. <laughs> no, apparently not, because you're on it, but you have, you'll have to work together. I mean, we have bridge crew to compare this to, and I have a feeling it's not going to be nearly as deep and immersive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. By the by, I finally went to the Void uh, last week oh, while yes. I was at Disney. How I was did, that? I wanted to do the Wreck-It Ralph, but it wasn't offered, so I did the Star Wars one. I, I mean, it's a, it's a good experience, I had some minor tracking issues, okay, um, which I think a lot of people um, uh, have with with some of the hand tracking. But it, it tracks a lot of things. You're talking about the, the hand tracking. Yeah, like, my hand tracking experience wasn't okay. great. Um, but all that being said, like I was with a group, somebody fired a gun early, so yes. we had to go it's into the into that mode. But uh, I really enjoyed the spit out of it because I was like, oh, I'm ready for it. So I was like on the ground rolling around. Really? Like, like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> I'm going to take full advantage. Like I can play VR at home. I can't play VR rolling around yeah. like uh, anywhere else. So that's cool. Yeah, I thought it was great. I can't wait for more um, locations to emerge. Speaking of Wreck-It Ralph, I finally saw Wreck-It Ralph 2. Yeah. I know you would want to talk about it months ago, and I'm ready to say. <laughs> I loved it. You it loved was good. it. You like you loved it. Yeah. Did you love the first one? Yes. Okay. It's very different movie than the first one. Yeah. 
Yeah, this was more of a closure. It was way. I don't think we need to wreck Ralph three. Okay, but here's my problem with it, as as I recall, because mm-hmm. I haven't seen it since it was in the theater. But their whole issue is that they're going to be separated now because uh, Vanellope is going to be in this other game, yeah, this GTA world, over the internet. Yeah. How's that any different from her being in another game in the arcade? Because they're no longer plugged in. They don't have the hub of meeting up in the power strip. They can't still do that over the internet? Over the Wi-Fi. Isn't that the point of the internet? I think it's beyond. It's less about like the physical locations of where they are. It's about her opening up her world, and they're having on different paths. They can still be best friends, but Sh- he needs to let her go. Sugar because... Rush is no fix-it Felix. They're already in different worlds. But it was a repetitive thing, and now she can grow as an yeah. AI, as a Tron. Oh. She can now explore the world where he is happy to go through his routine. He loves that, <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. And they can still be friends even though they are on different life paths. Wow. It's a, it's a divorce. Not a divorce. No, it's not. The, the, the whole point is that it's not a divorce. That it's, <laughs> but it's a letting go. Okay. It's a letting go, and I think yeah. that's what makes it a satisfying conclusion to really? their their relationship. Okay. What about all the modern day um, um, the references? IPs and companies? Did you enjoy that? I uh, thought it was the most meta of the Disney thing. It almost like it was like there was a D twenty three representation, like a Comic Con representation yeah. in 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 that story. It, it's not the timeless Disney story. Yeah, it was all a little too much. I yeah. like the old internet when you went down to the ground floor <laughs> and you saw... The, I, what was, it was very weird, creepy even. Like yeah. Was, like, Which is a monsters. pretty good description of the old yeah. internet. Yeah. Like, what was the deal with that the, sidekick character? It was the two bulging eyes and the tur- turtleneck? I don't remember that. You know, like the, the, the scammer? The scammer and oh, his yeah. friend who right. was, it's popped up and like and stretch out his arm? That was very weird. <laughs> I don't know if kids would like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I enjoyed the story. I thought the animation at the end was um, with a giant Ralph made of a lot of Ralphs. That was oh yeah, very unsettling. Yeah, it was very uh, like Ghostbusters yeah. weird. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, it was, that was very weird. Very unsettling because you'd focus. I would just focus on like the the little Ralphs that made up the big Ralph. Yeah, and they would kind of never show their faces. Something out of Akira or something. It was yeah, very it was, weird. Oh, it made give me chills down my spine. Yeah. Um, but. I thought they adapted well, and I, I, I'm glad that it wasn't about apps, like iPhone apps. My fear, because their logo was Wreck-It Ralph yeah, 2, like, like, like an iPhone app, app location. They had, in the trailer, they had like a video game app, but it was more about the internet at large, the web. It was actually more about the web than it was about apps. Yes. And I, and I like that. And then did you see the, the mid-credits sting? The mid-credits? Probably. What you know, was it? It was that j- the little girl's like, there was that joke in the, mo- the trailer that wasn't in the movie, and that makes me angry. Well, why don't you play the game? And then the game ended up being the joke that was in the trailer. That was very clever. Don't remember that. I still think the first one was better. Yeah, of course. It was more timeless. Far yeah. better. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that we, does we have it. one last. Oh, segment. we do. Oh, we do. Oh, we no, do. Let's skip yes. It. No. 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 no, no, we're, no. we're six episodes away. All right. You really want to do it? All right. Fine. We have one last segment, right? <sighs> okay. <sighs> Things that annoy me. <laughs> I gotta say, the stinger is really good. Thanks again for making that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know. Uh, you you watch you want you go on YouTube. You want to do some research, right? You're looking for how to how to videos, sure. and you click on one. It's got a lot of views. It comes up pretty early, and there's somebody shooting it who makes absolutely no sound. You ever do this? You watch these videos. Somebody's using their hands. The microphone's on. You're watching them construct something, engineer something, make something, and it would totally benefit from some audio narration. And they don't do it. But the microphone is on. The mic's on, dude. You like hear like ambient sound. There's somebody using their camera to its full extent and being completely silent, and that weirds me out. I can't handle it. You guys, you, it's like is it breathing the, behind you by and, your ear? And now, is, is it? Are you looking for more information, or is it the silence? I would love more information. I don't necessarily need it. If the mic was turned off, I'd get it. Okay, the guy doesn't know. Like maybe he didn't have a mic, or maybe he edited it out. 
But when they leave that sound on and they don't say anything, what's going on there is the person is self-conscious about their voice and about whether or not they sound good and whether or not they have anything to contribute. And all that does, the entire time you watch that video, it's all you get is like this person is self-conscious. Or they can't do and that they're makes, not trained to make do something for the camera and talk at the same time. That makes me uncomfortable. I don't think it's a lack of I mean, maybe a training would certainly solve the problem. But it's not like they're doing it wrong. They're not messing up what they say. They're just being quiet. How do you know they're not gonna mess it's, up what they say? Some people are shy that way. No, they might. You're right, but they're not even they're not doing that. I would rather see the person. I'd rather hear the person like express themselves, mess up, you know, just express yourself, be yourself. Which is fine. Yep. Do what you just communicate something to me. When they when they make videos with no sound, it's like it's like serial killer stuff. It just feels like completely oh <laughs> just it really weirds me out because it, it's just like creepy. Does YouTube need to have a, like a feature where you can press mute and in, play some generic music back? That would be great. Like, yeah, that's a good idea. Like they would detect your microphone is on but no sound. Let here's a here's an audio complimentary audio track. That we can. YouTube we can has sync. complimentary audio tracks. When you upload a video, you can add one. Mm -hmm. They should do that. They should automatically. A lot of people that like they even take the time to edit in subtitles and add text enhancements. They just forgot to turn they off just the audio. Freaking talk, man! <laughs> just talk. Just use your voice. It's okay. It's okay. We're all people. You don't have to be self-conscious. I mean, you're putting it on YouTube. You're taking that step. Mm -hmm. Just talk. That's how I feel about that. Also. Oh, whoa, double. We, oh, we got a double. Oh, we got a double. Also, Woo. I just, this is not a long one, but it's it's width and height, people. It's not width and height, all right? <laughs> Who is ending an H <laughs> on height? You listen for it, buddy. <laughs> you, It's out there. There are people that do it. No, they're not. Yes, there are. Width and height. Width and height. You will hear this. Wow, that's why they're self-conscious. Because <laughs> Jeremy's making fun of them. When they're mispronouncing things because they're so nervous yeah. making a video. All right, that's it. There you go. They're per well complimented. Someone telling you how to build a bookshelf <laughs> and measuring both so, the width wait, wait. and the height. Wait, wait, what if it's... And, and, and they, they I, don't, I don't want to say it. I have a verbal tick. Yeah. And people are going to make fun of me. What if it's height and wit? Wait, <laughs> that's I've never heard. That's pretty. That, that would be really bad. Well, there you go. Wonderful segment. Uh, I hope there's. We need I think five we, more. We can get to, to five hundred. Oh, that's a long list. It's very good. Five episodes left until episode five hundred. Thanks for listening, everyone, this week. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Kishore. We have an outro. We do. Here we go. Hi there. I didn't see you. Pass it. He's like, more, more, like <laughs> right in the veins. Like, <laughs> give me more dragons, dragons in the veins. Um, <laughs> I'm salivating just hearing about it. <laughs> I tried it and I didn't like it. <laughs> I don't remember what that's from. I don't either. That's yeah. good. That, that's from, I'll tell you who it's from. It's from Imperialist Rex. Oh, thank you, Imperialist Rex. You can uh, submit your own outros if you go to Google and just search t search Tested Podcast Outro. Hit the form link, download the template, upload it to SoundCloud, and we may play it in the future. Also, uh, you can always find us online at Tested.com, at Enchan here, at Jareware, and at Science Quiche. Send us your questions, things you would like us to talk about, any feedback for episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.